note before we begin, all the drawings in this video are done by me, Miranda Newell. Also, citations for the images are provided throughout the video, however, if you wait till the end, there is a list of complete citations, and this can be helpful if you want to also gain further information about any of the timeline entries. So this is my timeline project, titled Global Exchanges in Religious Practices and Beliefs. Enjoy! Afghanistan, Buddhas of Bamiyan. Before the Taliban destroyed them, the Buddha sculptures in the Bamiyan Valley of central Afghanistan amazed Buddhist and non-Buddhist travelers alike. The Bamiyan Buddhas were created over 1,000 years ago and were the largest of their kind. The two monumental statues were carved into the side of a cliff, and at the time they were erected, the two monuments stood at 53 and 36 meters. They were an awe-inspiring sight to see at the time, and still what remains of them today is appreciated by modern-day visitors. Buddhism, which originated in Southeast Asia, is not native to the Bamiyan Valley or what is now modern-day Afghanistan. This raises the question of why they were built there, and how Buddhism spread to Afghanistan. The answer to that question is through a network of trade routes that allowed the religion to spread. Historians now know that the Silk Route, or the Silk Road, was not one road, but an extensive network of trade routes that went both over land and by sea. Since the Buddhist religion was not confined to any particular location, it spread quickly along the supposed Silk Route between different travelers and different cultures, and many monuments were erected as a result. What is curious about these statues is that they reflect the area's multiculturalism during the period. The figures were very clearly influenced artistically by Indian, Central Asian, and Greek cultures. For example, they are pictured wearing draping robes, which is a Hellenistic or Greek tradition. Additionally, the monuments seem to hold an important mystical quality for those who encountered them. The Bamiyan Buddhas represent the spread of Buddhism along different trade routes from Southeast Asia to Afghanistan. They demonstrate clearly the connections between merchants, travelers, and the locals who were inevitably connected through these monuments. The impact these monuments had on the region and the travelers are, is clear. They influenced the spread of Buddhism and encouraged others to take it on. Furthermore, they solidified the region's legacy as being tolerant and accepting of multiculturalism before they were destroyed. Fertile Crescent and Inanna Inanna is the ancient Sumerian goddess of love, fertility, and war. She was not confined to the worship of only Sumerians, however, as the Akkadians and Assyrians also believed in her under the name of Ishtar. Inanna is represented in many different writings and forms of art. Sources often describe her as an independent woman who does as she pleases rather than as a mother goddess, as most female goddesses were. Temples and shrines throughout Mesopotamia were dedicated to her, proving her importance to the local religions. The primary source I will be analyzing for this entry is an excerpt from Enhejuana's Exaltation of Inanna text. Enhejuana was the important daughter of Sargon of Akkad, and she wrote literary and religious works that were copied and read long after she died. Essentially, my primary source demonstrates how knowledge about Inanna spread and was maintained throughout time in the land of the two rivers. The passage I am analyzing has been translated, and through it you can see how influential and revered Inanna was. There are a few quotes that most signify the importance of Inanna, however I'm just going to share one. When Enhejuana when writes, your great deeds are unparalleled, your magnificence is praised, we can see clearly that Inanna is a critical figure in ancient Sumerian faith. My primary source is global because through this poem, knowledge about Inanna spread across Sumer to other cultures and generations. It is evidence of the many connections of the time that allowed for the understanding and worship of Inanna to be maintained for so long. Specifically, people from all around ancient Mesopotamia were connected through her worship. People would have read or observed different images of her, practiced rituals to worship her, and communicated with others about her. Eventually, she was adapted to other religions under different names, evidencing her impact on regions and cultures outside of ancient Sumer. 
Ultimately, Inanna was an influential mystical figure whose prominence in local and extra-local cultures is evident. Throughout generations, she was worshipped and represented many global impacts. Tawan Tensuyu and Vera Kocha the Tawantinsuyu Empire, otherwise known as the Incan Empire, was a civilization that emerged in the Andean region in South America in the 13th century AD. At its height, they were an extremely influential empire with their territory covering an area of over 2 million square kilometers. In terms of religious beliefs, the Tawantinsuyu were polytheistic, meaning they believed in multiple gods and goddesses. For the purpose of this project, we will be discussing the goddess of Viracocha, who was one of the most important deities in the Andean region. However, they were not the only society that believed in Viracocha. In fact, they adopted the worship of Viracocha from the Tiwanaku culture, which was prominent in the Titicaca region from 400 AD to 1000 AD. The primary source I will be analyzing is a representation of Viracocha carved out of stone. This depiction of Viracocha was found in Tiwanaku, Bolivia. This depiction of Viracocha was initially carved in the year 300 CE, long before the Inca inhabited the region. Depicted in the center is Viracocha with a crown and worshippers surrounding him. Viracocha appears to be very large and in the center, showing how important and central he was to the people in this region. In terms of the global for this source, it is evident, as this carving represents a rich history of cultural practices and beliefs that spread among cultures in the Andes. First, despite this carving being created by the Tiwanaku culture, the Tawantinsuyu adopted it when they were eventually conquered that region. This process by which they embraced pre-existing monuments is truly a testament to how they incorporated the worship of Viracocha into their own culture. This primary source is evidence that the interactions between the Tawanaku and the Tawantinsuyu societies took place. Despite not directly interacting with each other, the Tawantinsuyu learned about Viracocha through pre-existing monuments and incorporated them into their own culture. This type of interaction is more indirect, but it is nonetheless still global because the Tawantinsuyu are interacting with ideas, monuments, and beliefs from a different culture. The impact is clear. Because of this, because of these interactions, despite being indirect, the god Viracocha had an immense impact on Tawantinsuyu belief systems, culture, and way of life. Ultimately, the Tawantinsuyu had a unique set of religious beliefs that were largely their own. However, they also incorporated some aspects of Tiwanaku culture into their own, namely the worship of Viracocha. This is a testament to how societies in the Andes influenced each other, proving that this entry is truly global. Ancient Egypt and the goddess Isis. For this timeline entry, I will be analyzing the spread of the cult of the goddess Isis, who was an ancient Egyptian goddess that spread into the ancient Mediterranean. The primary source for this entry is a really captivating piece of artwork found preserved in ash in Pompeii, Rome. The fresco, or wall painting, depicts a Roman adaptation of Isis in the painting Isis can be seen wearing Roman robes and beckoning Lo, the lover of Zeus, to Egypt. She can also be seen holding the Horn of Plenty, which is a symbol of Ceres, the Roman goddess of ag agriculture. This primary source is a really great example to show how the goddess Isis was integrated into local religion and cultures. Instead of just depicting Isis, the Romans in this artwork integrated her into their own beliefs and stories. They included their own local aspects, like the Horn of Plenty and Lo, the Lover of Zeus, while still maintaining the image of Isis, who is not traditionally a Roman goddess. This source is significant for global history for a number of reasons. In terms of global connections and exchanges, we can observe the networks that spread the goddess of Isis from and out of Egypt and into the Mediterranean area. Many different cultures adapted her into their own local context, and that is evidence of a network of interactions and exchanges that would have taken place for this to happen. This happened mainly through trade. It is also clear that she had a great impact on the surrounding religions and regions. She was a well-known and worshipped goddess who had a whole cult of followers and considerable impacts on multiple different cultures. However, as Christianity began to dominate the region, 
the worship of Isis was suppressed. Unfortunately, in the mid-6th century, Emperor Justinian closed her temple at Philae, and from there the worship of Isis was on a steady decline. Australia and the Dreamtime A primary source that reflects the concept of Dreamtime, which consists of stories, customs, practices, and laws that have defined groups of Australian Aboriginal peoples since their creation, is this painting of the Wanjina Rainmaker spirit found in a cave painted on a rock. The Wanjina Dreamtime story is significant for multiple language groups that come from the West and coastal areas of Kimberley, Australia. The Wanjina are a powerful creation spirit who is often as times associated with rain and themes of regeneration of the land and natural resources. This source is global for three main reasons. First, the Wanjina represent an oral tradition and belief system that has been passed down between many generations of Aboriginal peoples in the Kimberley area. Seeing how it has been sustained for so long proves it had a great impact on the Aboriginal peoples of the past, present, and future. Second, the concept of the Wanjina exists in different cultures in the, Kimberley, in the Kimberley area and has been adopted differently among them. This is global because we can observe connections about the Wanjina between various groups, including but not limited to the Wurrurrua, the Nairian, and the Winambal. All of these groups and more have been greatly impacted by their belief of Wanjina, as it is a key figure in their spiritual beliefs. Additionally, while many groups believe in the Wanjina, their practices and beliefs surrounding it vary. Finally, the source and entry represents the entire phenomenon of the dream time. Since the dream time is of shared belief among many Aboriginal groups in Australia, this is evidence of connections between them. Finally, the dream time has been has been and continues to be an integral part of Aboriginal belief systems, which is what makes this entry truly global. Inuit Nunangat and Sedna. The primary source I will be analyzing for this entry is the story of Sedna, the sea goddess. Sedna is a very important figure in Inuit culture and her story is told throughout the Arctic. The story varies from region to region, however the version I am analyzing is a compilation of many different Sedna stories. So I'm going to give you a very quick summary of the story. The story is about a woman in the Arctic named Sedna who marries a young man that promises her lots of meat and furs. After the marriage, they move to a secluded island. When they are alone on the island, the man reveals to her that he is not a human, but a bird dressed up as one. In the following weeks, Sedna grows sad because the bird man is only able to hunt fish. Eventually, her father comes and kills the bird man. The two of them, Sedna and her father, escape by boat. The birds are angry and cause big waves, and out of fear, her father tries to throw her out of the boat, but Sedna holds on tight, which leads him to cut her fingers off. Out of each finger grows a sea creature, and Sedna sinks to the bottom of the ocean, where she becomes a powerful spirit. Through this story, we can observe an important theme emerging, the lasting importance of Sedna to Inuit culture. This is best exemplified when the author states that, from each of her joints, sea creatures were born. They become fish, seals, walruses, and whales. These animals are fundamental sea creatures, and the fact that she was able to create them proves that she is an integral part of Inuit culture. My source demonstrates global connections for a few reasons. First, with who is being connected, the story reveals connections between different Inuit societies who all believe in the origin story of Sedna. The story also connects different generations of Inuit, as well as non-Inuit to Inuit people who learn about it. In terms of the impact, we can see how the story is integral to Inuit culture. But the story of Sedna has shaped the way that Inuit people view themselves, their land, and their culture. The story continues to greatly shape traditional Inuit ways of life, and because it is recorded orally, it will continue to have lasting impacts for generations to come. Kingdom of Mali and Ibn Battuta Islam was not always present in West Africa. It can be dated as having reached the region in the 8th century. 
The spread of Islam into West Africa was a gradual and complex process and can be linked to trade and commerce with North Africa and the Mediterranean. The empire we will be observing for this project is the Mali Empire, which existed from the years 1215 to 1450. Much of what we know about this empire comes from foreign scholars and travelers who wrote about it in their travels, specifically the famed 14th century Muslim traveler from North Africa, Ibn Battuta, visited Mali after its esteemed ruler Mansa Musa had died. For context, for context Mansa Musa was the richest person ever to have existed and famously shared his wealth with many people. Ibn Battuta wrote about his travels to the Kingdom of Mali in a textual source he titled Country of the Blacks. He was influenced to travel to Mali because he wanted to acquire the wealth he heard had been given by its rulers. In his text, he describes not just his experience in the Kingdom of Mali, but also in surrounding areas and cities. In his writing, we see evidence of a major theme, the spread of Islam and its integration into the local culture. This is best exemplified when he states that, the women of the kingdom of Mali have no shame before men and do not veil themselves, yet they are punctilious about their prayers. When he says this, we can see that the people of Mali do practice Islam, but in their own way that blends aspects of their own culture, hence the, faith, the fact that the women do not wear veils. The source is global for a number of reasons. It shows the connections that took place between Ibn Battuta and the people of the kingdom of Mali. These interactions and connections led to a wealth of knowledge about the empire which was eventually spread across the world. The impact of this source is clear. It is a reflection of the spread of knowledge about different variations of Islam. Additionally, it is more broadly reflective of how Islam was not practiced the same everywhere in the world. It was a religion that was adapted into different local contexts, and this text helps us to understand that. Even though Ibn Battuta's source may have been biased or overly pessimistic, it is an important tool for understanding the Kingdom of Mali and Islam in the West Africa during this period of time. Ancient Sogdiana and Hinduism Hinduism was not always confined to the region of Southeast Asia. Interesting enough, the religion spread all over Asia. In fact, evidence of the religion can be found all the way in what is now modern-day Uzbekistan. 7th century Uzbekistan, or Sogdiana, was home to many religions not native to the region, including Hinduism. Hinduism spread to this region through trade routes which are often referred to as the Silk Road. Muslim Arabs who entered the region of Sogdiana in the 8th century often destroyed any non-Muslim art and architectural remains. However, some artifacts remained, especially in the city of Penjikant. The primary source for this entry is a mural of Shiva, one of the principal deities of Hinduism, with Sogdian attendees. This mural was found in Penjikant and depicts a Hindu god adapted into Sogdian culture. Essentially, it represents how Hinduism spread into Sogdiana and impacted the local religions. The Middle East and the Crusades Not all interactions between religions have been peaceful throughout history. This point is well supported when we look at the history of the Crusades from the year 1095 to 1291. During this period of Crusades, European Christians invaded the areas inhabited by Muslim and Jewish people. This timeline entry focuses on the year 1184 during the years preceding the Third Crusade. Specifically, it is focused on the account of one Muslim traveler named Abu al Hussein Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Jubair from Muslim Spain. The primary source for this entry is Ibn Jubair's written account of his trip back from Mecca, where he spent 32 days in Crusader territory. For the purpose of this project, we will investigate one small section of this text where he describes his time spent in the Syrian city of Acre, which was conquered. When writing about Acre, Ibn Jubair makes note of a few things that can be described as global. We will look at one. When he is describing the city, he says how it is the meeting place of Muslim and Christian merchants from all regions. This is significant because it highlights that interactions were being had between Muslims and Christians, despite their differences. 
This source is global for a few reasons. Primarily, this primary source reflects the religious interactions and connections that happened at the time. Christians conquered much land, leading to the deaths of many non-Christians, primarily Muslims. However, many natives to the conquered territories had to live with the Christians. As the Christians took over their territories, their ways of life changed to accommodate them, and this led to many interactions. The impact is clear. There was much cross-religious mixing during this period, as well as the slaughter of many people. On the other hand, Ibn Jubair's account represents the production and dissemination of knowledge about life in the conquered lands. This is global because through his writing, others interacted with it and knowledge spread, hence an immense impact. Ultimately, Ibn Jubair witnessed the loss and conquering of his faith, Islam. Thanks to his account, we can better understand how he experienced this change as if we were there ourselves. Thank you so much for watching and listening to my video. I hope you learned something valuable about global history and how interactions have taken place throughout time. If you're interested in learning more about these timeline entries, I have provided a list of sources at the end of the video. However, I have also provided a list of links to websites that relate to these timeline entries in the caption below. Thank you so much guys!